good evening everyone we hope you are all staying at home and staying safe i'm gayatri manu the program associate at science gallery bengaluru and we are so delighted to have you with us uh, for this program which is a part of our second exhibition season contagion contagion is completely digital so you can experience contagion at www.nowtransmitting.com i'm delighted to introduce you all to lena bui and fredrik kek today who are here with us and we're going to discuss lena bui's film where birds dance their last Her film is extremely relevant at a moment when the world is reeling from an environmentally linked zoonotic pandemic. In this film, Lena provides a crucial perspective on the threat of bird flu by following farm workers in a village in North Vietnam where duck duck feathers are sorted and exported to China. Where birds dance their last touches upon various questions surrounding our consumption of animals and animal produce. changes in rural landscape and how disease affects people beyond the aspect of health in case you missed watching the film before joining us for this discussion i would like to encourage you all to watch the film which is available on our website until 13th june lena bui lives and works in saigon vietnam her works are sometimes amusing anecdotes and other times in depth articulation of the impact of rapid development on people's relationship with nature she reflects on the way that intangible aspects of life such as faith death and dreams influence our behavior and perception fredrik kek is a senior researcher at the laboratory of social anthropology After studying philosophy at Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris and anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley, he has investigated the history of social anthropology and contemporary biopolitical questions raised by avian influenza. He was the director of the research department of the Musée du Quai Branly between 2014 and 2018. Before we begin the session I would remind you all to put your questions in the Q&A box so that the discussant can answer them after the session and I would also remind you all to fill out the feedback form which has been put in the chat box so that we can know what worked well for this program and what we can improve going forward Now I would like to hand over the mic to Lena who is just going to show us a little bit about the process of making her film Where Birds Dance Their Last Over to you, Lena. Hello. Thank you very much for joining me today. My name is Lena. I'm speaking from my studio in Saigon. Uh, so I would like to share a little bit about my process um, and the background of this work. So, Um, so um, the research was uh, um, the, this film was created, uh, or rather, it was a video installation was created uh, when I was invited uh, as an artist in residence at the Oxford Clinical Research Unit in Ho, Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, so it's hosted by the um, Hospital of Tropical uh, Disease. in Saigon and it has been in Saigon since 1991 so it's a, a fairly well established uh, research unit in in Saigon and um when they have uh, their main funder the Wellcome Trust initiated a a project called Art in Global Health uh, they decided to bring an artist into the research studio uh, and uh, the research unit and um in a way it was a very uh, fruitful collaboration for me because i end up working on three other projects with them after this initial uh, uh, uh video so um yeah i've been uh collaborating on and off with them for um maybe almost 9 years now uh with the unit in saigon and also they have a unit in nepal um so Uh, what they do at the unit is uh, they do a lot of research on antimicrobial research uh, resistance uh, and various infectious disease like HIV, malaria, uh, dengue, emerging disease, and also zoonosis. Uh, and um, a part uh, part of the work involves uh, working in the lab 
uh, but uh, some of the work also uh, work in the field in communities or in farms um, and particularly the the group uh, zoonosis which is the group that study infectious disease between human and animal um, they go and do a lot more field works uh, than other uh, research uh, groups. Uh, so I was particularly drawn to this group as, as a, um, artists and, and my interest is very much on human behaviors and how uh, certain habits or certain customs uh, occur uh, uh, in a community, uh, in a culture. Uh, so, uh, and especially also as someone who grew up and uh, lived mostly in the city, I was very curious about the countryside. Um, so uh, I chose to mainly focus uh, and work with them, and uh, they uh, study a variety of uh, pathogens in animals like Streptococcus, uh, Salmonella, E. coli, and actually a lot of their work is on antimicrobial resistance, but um, when you talk of like a zoonotic disease, I think uh, what captures people's attention is the, the very infectious disease like bird flu or swine flu. Um, like, uh, so this is uh, widely featured in newspapers and also uh, have a very immediate and uh, strong effect on daily people's lives. Uh, so I was doing research on this and I came up on this photograph in a newspaper um, about the first uh, very widespread um, um, avian flu uh, outbreak in Vietnam in 2005. And during this uh, period, like a lot of uh, uh, poultry in Vietnam were kill uh, killed, uh, so 1.2 million. Uh, chickens were killed uh, to prevent um, the, the disease from spreading. And uh, it, I mean, I think uh, the Vietnamese government has quite a lot of experience with uh, this type of big outbreaks because we are tropical and, uh, and susceptible to quite a lot of different uh, disease uh, outbreaks and stuff. Um, so this, but this, a uh, photo particularly is very interesting to me because the, it's almost like a blurring between the human and, and, and animal. Uh, this woman, she almost becomes a big bird. And so as I dig more into this uh, location of the photo photograph, which is in a small village outside of uh, Hanoi, um, and uh, they have been collecting feathers for uh, three, four generations, and they export it mostly to China. Um, so uh, they suffered a lot of um, uh, damage during this, uh, this outbreak, not because of people getting sick, uh, but because of their livelihood uh, when China stopped accepting imports from from Vietnam and uh, also, um, uh, you know, it's just uh, um, also the stigma with, with the job itself because it's so visibly uh, associated with uh, the disease at that time. So half the village switched to doing something else. And uh, so it's a, a small village like, uh, or used to be a small village because, um, this part used to be Hanoi, uh, but now it's uh, this whole green area. And, and, and so this part that's uh, um, highlighted or like uh, detailed here is only the small dots. Uh, so now, and, and the very big area here is now the municipal uh, capital region of Hanoi. So, you know, the metropolitan area is just expanding like crazy. So it become a very dense, uh, densely populated area as well. And, uh, but I, I, I'm still very interested in it because it uh, still has retained a lot of the old traditions uh, and uh, old way of life, even though um, geographically or like um, the, the uh, layout and uh, the density has increased a lot, but they kept old traditions. Uh, like this festival has been around supposedly since the, uh, the end of the eighth century. 
uh, to honor an, uh, a general that defeated the Tang Dynasty army. Uh, so, um, I mean, in I think in India, it's there are so many festivals, but in Vietnam, actually, this kind of small scale village um, festivals are becoming uh, less and less, uh, fewer and fewer places manage to retain their kind of individual custom. Uh, mostly now, uh, you know, we adapt a certain, a very similar lifestyle and belief and, and habits. Um, yeah, so um, back to uh, the part of the feather. So um, yeah, chi China, uh, is a huge producer of uh, feathers and also importers because um, they duck is a big part of their diet. Uh, so so all of the this very small village and everything is sorted by hand. They go and collect uh, feathers from wet markets around Hanoi area. Uh, then it's transported to the border of China, uh, where they have bigger turbines to separate the Dao feather from the bigger, uh, bigger feathers. Um, so that was when I did the research. But uh, recently, I uh, looked a bit more into it. And it seems like within Vietnam, they have built some factories. So uh, there is a shift uh, a little bit. Um, and um, yeah, but but so the other so this is one aspect like for the viral virologist that uh, virologist that works with me then this this village is really a fascinating place because uh, you know they they uh, for them it's uh, a really hot spot like uh, there could be a lot of studies done here uh, but in a term in term of medical research it takes a very very long time to set up a cohort. Uh, because you have to go through a lot of clearance. Um, but for me, as sort of a, a, a kind of a free artist, uh, I could come as an observer. So I came and visit this place and uh, asked the people if I could film them. And uh, it, uh, it took a few visits, but uh, because I was working um, very, like, it's just me and uh, one other friend as a camera person so uh, in a way uh, we were we could gain access uh, to this place and um, but so that's the part that links with the science but I want to talk about another part that I feel was makes my work different from a, just a, a documentary because I'm very also very influenced by mythologies and uh, avian humanoids or this kind of shape-shifting uh, figure between human and animal is uh, something that is present in, in so many different folklores and mythologies uh, throughout various cultures. Um, and, and I think it's a really fascinating aspect. Uh, for example, you have this uh, um, uh, figure of the call in the west it's the swan maiden and in the east it's always also um, usually a woman that uh, is a swan uh, coming from uh, a sort of a deity or a goddess and she comes down and, and has this uh, robe of feathers which she shed uh, and then she's uh, some immortal will fall in love with her and hide her and then she's sort of trapped. Uh, so I think this sort of um, uh, the ability to fly and the form of the bird carries a lot of, uh, of uh, symbolism and meaning for, for people as something very mystical and magical and also something dangerous. Uh, for example, in the Russian folklore, there's the uh, Alkonos and the Syrian uh, who are like birds that sing very beautiful songs of uh, sorrow and of joy and lure people. So uh, even these kind of characters, their roles change through time because at some point they are dangerous uh, and a threat because they are irresistible uh, in their 
presence and also in their songs. Uh, but at other times, they are considered sort of uh, beings of paradise and signal something of harmony. Uh, so, so even throughout uh, uh, mythology, depending on the times and the location, so this uh, character is to, uh, present throughout the Slavic regions. Uh, and um, their, their symbols or their function changes uh, according to the times as well. And then we also have, uh, of course, in India, there's the Garuda, which is the vehicle of Vishnu, uh, very, very prominent uh, uh, avian humanoid. Uh, and uh, he, uh, originated from India, but now he's now present in all over Southeast Asia and is the symbol of, uh, national symbol of Indonesia. So um, uh, we share this kind of mystical creatures and uh, a sort of awe towards them. Uh, and uh, 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 one creature that I was really fascinated uh, in doing my research was the uh, Nava Gunja, uh, a mystical creature in the Indian mythology, and it, and it's really a very strange and bizarre myth mythical creature for me because it's composed of nine different animals. It has a rooster head, a peacock neck, a hump of a, a bull, waist of a lion, and then three feet standing is the elephant. The tiger, a uh, deer or cow here, and then the last feet is the hand, a human hand holding either a lotus or a wheel, and the tail is the snake. So, uh, and it's supposedly the uh, sort of a manifestation of Krishna. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, and, and sort of the spirit of uh, the forest. Uh, angered forest basically uh, appearing in front of the hero Arjuna uh, in the Mahabharata. So uh, this, I feel this kind of creatures signal a certain kind of um, a very primordial um, awe and respect towards nature and also our relationship with it, which is, you know, always, um, a part of nature, but also some sort of reverence to it. And um, so when I conceived my work, it is an installation. So in um, it's supposed to show in a space on two separate wall, uh, meaning that it should be, uh, uh, and, and these are big screens. So you walk in and you are, um, sort of surrounded by this kind of movement of feathers and, uh, and the ambient sound. Uh, so it, it does change the, the experience quite a bit uh, when you're watching it flat side by side on, on the computer screen. Uh, but uh, because of the circumstances that we are in, uh, you know, online is the most uh, practical um, sort of uh, format. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to, and I think what worked for the piece was because it was, uh, there's a disconnect or, or a certain kind of, uh, uh, you have, you're seeing something very, very white and very clean, but you also at the same time rationally knows that it's not, uh, and, and actually during the filming process, it's a very, very smelly place. Uh, and uh, within the village itself, because uh, it, it's uh, so uh, potent, the smell and also the dust. Uh, so the workers have shifted, have been pushed to the cemetery area on the outskirt of the village because within, inside the village itself, it's too, um, it's, it's just too, uh, too, too dusty, too dirty for people. Uh, now that the density increased. So all of this that you see are tombstones, uh, older ones. Um, yeah. And so after uh, this work, I continued to collaborate with the uh, zoonosis team at uh, Oxford Clinical Research Unit on another, uh, um, on another uh, much longer um, sort of, documentary, but 
kind of a creative documentary maybe uh, because it's uh, there's a script written but it is very much based on the stories that I hear in in the uh, locality so this one was uh, a lot more involved I spent quite a lot of time uh, this this was shot in the Mekong Delta uh, in in Vietnam and um, I you know it's a very idyllic uh, small uh, neighborhood in the Mekong Delta and I spent quite a lot of time visiting different farmers that the local vets work with and finally uh, uh, invited one family to be in the film. So most of the characters in the film are just local people. They are non-actors, and there's uh, the one main actress and uh, two other are brought in from outside, uh, sort of to keep the story going. Uh, so it's about a, a pig farming household in the Mekong Delta because again the talk about zoonotic or um, I think there's nothing more immediate uh, than our uh, in terms of our relationship with nature than what we eat because that's you know the, the our actual like need and uh, what we eat is uh, yeah what we eat is what it eats eats so there's a whole chain of uh, results and consequences going on. So people are a lot more aware or more concerned when it comes to their food. And uh, uh, so uh, this uh, small household and uh, a sort of, um, so what the, uh, the, the scientists were studying uh, at this place particularly was antimicrobial resistance because in Vietnam, there's a practice of mixing antibiotics into the animal feed because this helped them gain weight and also um, uh, help them uh, sort of stay strong. But at the same time, this is not a sustainable um, practice because eventually, you know, you come upon resistance and it become a really big problem in, in Vietnam and in the region uh, because of this very, um, a uh, very uh, sort of uh, unregulated uh, usage. Um, and, uh, uh, but the thing is, it's also apparent when you work with community and you, you go to places, then you realize that the big concerns of the mass or the big, the consumer isn't necessarily the concerns of the, the farmer themselves because um, you know, they are more concerned with immediate consequences, such as the price of meat and the, 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 the weight, uh, the breed, uh, what is more productive in terms of uh, time and money input. Uh, so, uh, and, and so also what they were concerned about is also kind of um, more uh, sort of, uh, everyday disease that animals have. So they, they were more interested in having a vet there than a scientist studying something very broad and, and rather abstract for them. Um, so it's interesting to see some of those and I think we'll talk a little bit more uh, after that. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so these uh, two uh, works are kind of, uh, um, large work that I really spend time with both scientists and communities uh, to form. Um, and yeah, so yeah, we'll, we'll expand a little bit more uh, in the discussion. Um, thank you. So. Thank you very much, uh, Lena. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, discuss your, your work. Uh, as an anthropologist working on uh, avian influenza in uh, East Asia. I've been really struck by your film when I um, saw it for the first time in uh, 2013 at the Welcome Collection. Um, it, it was a time when I was finishing my own research um, on uh, avian influenza in Hong Kong and Taiwan, which I contacted between 2007 and 2013. And I was, I was taking this position at the Musée du Quai Banli, um, which is a, a museum of anthropology, but where the, there's um, a contemporary artist 
involved and I was looking for a way to um, uh, describe through art uh, the kind of tensions that I was seeing in the management of um, zoonoses such as uh, avian influenza. Uh, and so when I, when I saw your film in the installation uh, with, the, with, with the noise and the atmosphere and, and I, I could imagine the smell and the, um, and, and, and the dust. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a, a bodily experience to, to, to see that, that, that film that we don't have on the internet, of course, but we need to imagine what, what it means. Um, I, I, I could really relate that to the experience I had as an anthropologist working with, uh, with farmers, with um, uh, retailers um, in, in Hong Kong. Um, and and, and I, I want to, to, to dwell a little bit on that. Uh, um, um, relying on my own work and, and uh, of other anthropologists who have studied um, avian influenza in, in China or in, in Vietnam. Um, so, so just, just um, uh, um, a re as a reminder, uh, the, the H5N1 virus um, has uh, appeared in Vietnam in 2004, 2015, um, 2005, 2004, 2005, and, and it had emerged in, in Hong Kong in 1997. And um, it was a very uh, deadly virus. Uh, two thirds of the per per people who uh, uh, were infected by this virus died, but on the whole, it, it was not very contagious. Uh, so it was very lethal, but very not very contagious. Um, around 800 people got infected uh, around the world since 1997 and 500 of them died. But when the virus appeared in Vietnam, there was a major fear that it would spread all over uh, Southeast Asia. Indonesia was a major uh, hotspot um, with, with potentially human to human transmission. And Vietnam was very strong in um, controlling the disease uh, at, at, at the animal level. Uh, so there was this strategy uh, since 1997 that um, this new flu virus could become pandemic. And if it was stopped at the animal level, then uh, the, the consequences of, of a pandemic could be mitigated. That's what's called being prepared for the next pandemic, which had a lot of other aspects, such as exercises in hospitals and stockpiling masks and, and vaccines. But, but this idea to control the, the next pandemic at the, at the animal level was, was very strong in, in, in Southeast Asia and taken very seriously by, by Vietnam as, as a way to, um, uh, uh, to, to also be integrated in the global community as a, as, as a serious state. And, and, and we know that uh, Vietnam has been very respected also for its management of SARS and, and COVID-19, uh, which was another uh, zoonosis coming from, from that. Uh, but which turned out to be um, uh, much more contagious than, than, than H5N1. So as, as you say, um, the, the, the virologists in Vietnam work on many other diseases um, that are uh, more deadly in daily life, such as um, microbial resistance and <clears throat> streptococcus. But what makes an infectious disease such as um, avian influenza or um, zoonotic coronaviruses very frightening is that um, uh, we don't know how our bo human bodies react to this um, to these viruses. These viruses circulate among uh, among animals, but when they infect a human body, as we see with the COVID nineteen, most of us have no symptoms, but uh, uh, um, elderly people and not only elderly people have very bizarre reaction and 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 and. This this unpredictability uh, causes the fear of the of the pandemic, and 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 some um, virologists in the in, in in this school of ecology of infectious diseases said that zoonoses were a revenge of nature against humans because we thought we had controlled nature with vaccines, um, but but new viruses emerge and they are really unpredictable. So there is this element of fear uh, for infectious diseases that that. Is, is, is very uh, um, rational in some way, uh, but, but it, also, it also took very irrational forms for, for the lay public, um, as we saw with, with these images of, of chickens 
uh, as monsters or, or even as terrorists, we know with, with, with bombs around their uh, uh, belt um, uh, in some representations in, in Egypt, for example, uh, or in, in the famous book uh, by Mike Davis, The Monster at Our Door, um, a, a, a dark chicken with, with its wings uh, attacking humans. Um, and, and what I like we, in your work is that you, you, you give us this, this idea of, of, of threat and, and fear um, with, I mean, this, all this, this um, uh, animal uh, uh, realm that, that, that we don't know so much because we live in cities, uh, but yet you, you give us also an idea of what it means to live with animals. And, and so the, the, the impact of infectious diseases um, coming from animals um, is, is not only that it makes us sick, but as you, as you said, um, it makes us reflect on what we eat. Uh, we think that eating chicken is, is, a, is, a, is a commodity and, and chicken has become really the, the most uh, commodified uh, animal in the world uh, in the last uh, 40 years. Um, uh, even if it has been domesticated in Southeast Asia 7,000 years ago, uh, it is now a global product. It's, 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 I mean, the biomass of chicken in the world is equivalent to the biomass of all other birds. So it's amazing how this, this uh, species has, has become a, a globalized commodity. And at the same time, we, when we are potentially infected by avian influenza, we remember that, that uh, chickens are uh, birds and that they are alive and that they have um, these, these viruses. Um, and that's why uh, this, these two representations of the, of, of the bird as a, as, a, as a commodity and as a living being produce very, very strange images, as, as I said, with, the, uh, with the, the image of the monster. But you, you show us another image, which is the, the, the image of the humanoid, uh, the, the human transforming into a bird, uh, which, is, which is both paradise and hell, uh, if I understand your mythical references. Um, and just to, to give you an, an instance of, of the, the kind of um, very parallel phenomena I found in my research. So th there was a controversy in, in Hong Kong uh, on the, the release of, of birds. So there were Buddhist practitioners who, who went to uh, markets and they, they bought uh, birds to release them for spiritual purposes. You probably know that in in, in Vietnam, it's, it's spread all around Southeast Asia. Um, it's, it was very bizarre for a European um, anthropologists like me, uh, but, but, but so there was this idea that if you, if you um, release a bird, the soul of the bird will produce merit and these merits will be accountable for you in your, in your next life. So there was this idea of sharing souls with, with birds in the Buddhist practices. But at the same time, the, the, the bird watchers um, were very mobilized on the risk of uh, avian influenza sh showed uh, that when Buddhists released birds, um, uh, the birds died because they were, they were stressed, they were packed in cages. So they, by, they died of all kinds of diseases, but sometimes with avian influenza. And so there was a discussion between bird watchers, virologists and, and Buddhists uh, um, to uh, stop releasing birds and, and, and advise practitioners to release um, like seafood, like uh, um, fish and um, shells and tortoise. And so I could see in, in the temples, in the Buddhist temples, images of birds that were released and transforming into cadavers. So it, it was a very striking image where, you, because the, the, the image of the bird opening its wing is, is very lively. It's an image of freedom, but at the same time, the, 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 the bird, the released bird turns into a cadaver um, and, you, and you see the skeleton behind the, 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 the feathers. And I, I like this idea, this image uh, of, of life and death at the same time, and also mixing it with spiritual um, intentions and, and gestures, uh, connecting humans and, and animals. And I could find the same kind of, of interesting mix between life, death, uh, physicality and spirituality in, in, in your work, because uh, it's 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 an image that is um, taken in, in a symmetry, uh, as you say. It's in the outskirts of a of a of a city of the city of Hanoi, um, and um, and these people are living in this village, and they probably have some immunity, so they don't they're, they're not afraid of of um, carrying these uh, these feathers. 
But for us, um, watching this film with the images of, of birds as monsters, we think that they might um, be infected by this virus. And also we think that these birds have been killed. And, and it's very nice that you don't show us um, uh, images of birds that have been killed. In, in Hong Kong, it's about 1.5 million birds that have been killed for avian influenza, the same number as, as, as Vietnam. So it's really in the, in the mind of people when they think about in, in influenza, all these birds that have been killed to preserve uh, human life. Um, so, so birds are killed on a daily basis, basis to produce community, but birds are also killed um, in, in, very, in, in times of crisis. And, and so when you only see the remains of the birds, um, which are the feathers, it's very light. So it, it's, it's like the soul of the bird, but it's, it's also um, uh, uh, very lively. We can feel the presence of, of the bird. Uh, in in the feathers, so I, I I wanted to ask you to to come back to this this mix of life and death in in the image, and also we we uh, for people who have seen the film, I think we we hear the conversations of people and they talk a lot about marriage and um, and also uh, burial, so they talk about life and death in their community, so. Um, um, so, so the, the, what was very interesting for me as an anthropologist is that you, you, you are not constrained by the protocols of, of um, virologists. You can go freely and find your own place and, and, and talk with people and meet these people. And you choose this village where there's a lot of life and death, uh, there's a lot of community and immunity. Um, and, and so can you, can you come back to this kind of da daily life of, of the village in the film? Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, I think, um, I'm not sure if it's part of culture or if it's just part of being an artist. I think uh, life and death is kind of two sides of one coin and they're very close. And there's nothing, I don't feel a very like big, I think you need one and the other and they, they are always there present at the same time. And so I'm fascinated with also these moments. Uh, for example, aside from the, uh, in, in the next film that I did in the village uh, where they raise animal, they also uh, kill their own, uh, when they need to eat chicken or duck, or then they, they do the killing themselves. Uh, it's very common like, to buy a life or to just, pluck one chicken from the backyard and, and do the killing. So it's a very um, a sort of, uh, and in a way, I think it's a healthy process because you know where your food comes from. And you also have a certain respect because you raise this animal and you have to go through the dirty act of killing it to eat it. Uh, so it, it's, um, uh, it's a much more um, sort of uh, close relationship than say you just go into the supermarket and buy a product that no longer looks like any animal. Uh, and I think if you don't really pay attention, you probably, uh, well, I mean, if for like a bigger piece of meat, like a cow or a pig, I, often I don't really know which part of the animal it comes from or how they look. Uh, so, so all of this, we have become extremely removed. Uh, and in that small village, it seems they, uh, yeah, so, so people were talking about also how they maintain old tradition, weddings goes on for a few days uh, and, and they are working in the graveyard. So they spend, they work there sometimes all night. So they spend a lot of time with the dead people. And uh, in a way, it's a very, the attitude is a very matter of fact. Uh, uh, attitude or, or it's just their daily life it, it's not not a big separation um, which yeah I think and and a lot of times we we try to find a I think a very visible and uh, concrete target for our uh, sort of fear uh, but but a lot of, and, and then we sort of uh, focus, sort of fixate on this very vis visible aspect, but not on 
on the actual cause. Uh, so a lot of these kind of traditions, for example, like the monk releasing the sparrow, which also happens here, where they pack, they really pack a lot of mm. sparrows into one, mm. one very small cage. And then you see the monk opening the cage, but the birds are like stumbling out their days. They're like, they cannot fly anymore. Um, mm. So this, uh, obviously, a lot of the traditions that we still keep, we, we sort of keep it wholesale or from, from what it was, but circumstances I think have quite changed where the density is really uh, so much higher than what it used to be. Like a, say a, a, a festival back in the days, probably only have like a few hundred people, whereas now it's like a couple, thousand hundred thousand so so the the scale is completely different and and same with farming or with uh, uh, any animal produce that we we, we consume uh, the, the scale has just become like really I think much larger than what we are rationally equipped or or like basically we just cannot process it yet and so we consume because it's there but and we keep certain practices that worked in older days, but maybe don't mm. uh, work anymore. Just, yeah. And so, um, I don't know. I think we're always struggling to keep pace with the, the, the rate of change mm -hmm. uh, going on, yeah. yeah. On this issue of, of scaling, um, so anthropologists and economists have showed that avian influenza was an opportunity for um, big industrial farms to um, receive funding from the government because they could um, they could implement biosecurity measures uh, that were protecting from infect from zoonosis, whereas small farms were um, could not afford these these measures, and so um, the, the the price of these measures was too high uh, uh, if it was added to the price of food and, and everything. And, and so the, the, the prevention of avian influenza um, was in favor of, of big farms, whereas we know that um, the risk of contagion is higher in, in big farms because there is this density uh, and there is um, uh, uh, homogeneity, whereas when there is diversity, there is a kind of dilution effect that uh, um, um, prevents zoonotic viruses from being dangerous. Um, and so you saw in, in your other film, these questions of scaling and how fa farmers manage the question of the price and, um, and, and, and the role of the vet. But can you, can you tell us from this film, what is the scale of this um, uh, activity of, of producing feathers? I mean, you, you told us that there was a, an exportation to, to China where they use turbines to produce, to select the feathers for pillows. But what, what, is, what is the scale? How many people are working in this, um, in this village and, and, and where are the, 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 the poultry coming from? Um, so the scale of the village is uh, they count by household and then the household will also hire outside workers. Uh, so I think at one point it was maybe 20, 30 households which was the height of it. Uh, yeah, so quite big and, and they um, do it very manually. So they just go to a lot of the wet markets and they, they bicycle around Hanoi and they call out like buy feather. So mm. they could buy even like if you're eating one or two duck, uh, you could sell that feather uh, mm -hmm. back in the days. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very, um, See, see, so this is also another interesting aspect because you go to this place and it's very manual and it's very small scale and you really don't think that it will connect to a wider chain of uh, consumption or manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but somehow it, they're all connected and same with the small household farms, uh, like a, a lot of the breeds of, of animals that are raised in, uh, for example, pigs in Vietnam. They're, they're, it's very hard to find the local pigs now because they, they, they're smaller. 
and so they don't make as much of a profit. So I think the most common breed is a Yorkshire or a Hampshire. So it's a UK breed. Uh, uh, so most of the pigs in the supermarket, I mean the pork sold are from European breed uh, types of pigs. So, so nowadays I think there's this convolution, like the, this uh, convergence of uh, basically things coming from everywhere and going everywhere, even from a very, very small scale that you think would, uh, you would imagine is very local, mm. uh, but actually not. Uh, so, so this is also a part that I was uh, quite, I think very surprised and, and impressed with as well. Uh, so in talking with them, they're like, oh yeah, our main, uh, our main customer is from China. And it, it just really, was you know not something I came uh, mm -hmm. to the place and and had uh, uh, could think of uh, yeah so um, so, so now, it's part of a, yeah sorry uh, no Go no ahead. but uh, so that was the hype but I think now uh, much fewer people do it so maybe half uh, yeah it's mm -hmm. so it's part of a metabolism process i mean the, mm -hmm. it's the recycling of the feathers uh, and separating mm -hmm. from the from the feces probably um, but that I, I can imagine the smell um and i i, I wanted to ask you um uh, on the relation between contact and contagion um because when we see these people working daily with these feathers we we thought we think they might be infected um but and and when we read books about avian influenza we have this image of the of the, the, the child who uh, kisses birds and and is, is surrounded by feathers so so feathers is actually a, a main source of transmission but uh, and and live poultry markets also because customers are not used to um being in contact with live poultry but do you have an idea of um studies that have been made in this village about their immunity to uh, influenza? Um, so they, in the newspaper, uh, you know, they're labeled like the dangerous village, uh, mm. but on coming and talking to the workers, then they, I mean, they say um, that none of them got sick. Um, mm. But then this is also, you know, there there isn't really a study, so so you know, it's just uh, one side is screaming by the visuals, and the other is sort of like uh, also, um, yeah. There's this question also: if if you get sick in this time, uh, like in the, with this type of emerging disease that people are very suspicious of, there really isn't any incentive to to tell people mm. that you're sick. You know, because mm -hmm. then you're stigmatized. Uh, you, you uh, or your if you're a farmer, then your livestock are kill, killed. So they're, you know, like so you lose out. Uh, so there really isn't, I feel, any incentive for a small scale worker or farmer to signal uh, disease coming out. And yeah. usually it, it would be like a vet or someone get very sick and they go to the hospital. Um, but otherwise, um, yeah, there, there's no nothing for them in it. Uh, mm. Yeah. So. Um, I think we're going to turn to some questions. Yes. <laughs> from the audience. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, Nandish says, as an artist in a research lab, how was your experience working with people of science. As in India, these kind of interdisciplinary interactions are quite rare. Um, so it is, uh, it's not easy. <laughs> and I, I'm really outnumbered because I was the only artist at the, at the unit. So, um, so there is, uh, it would be more of an initiative of me showing interest in the research and reading up on their research and learning the, the lingos, you know, the different, uh, you know, at least the layman, uh, like vocabulary of 
of, of the science that's being studied. Um, and, uh, and then gradually also sort of, because I make visual work, so they do see the outcome. Uh, and so it, it's not until the work is um, completed that there is a little bit more of a feedback from the other side, from the science side, uh, because then they can sort of relate to, to the visuals, to their work. Uh, whereas before, I think in a way, maybe it's not so much a disinterest, but also a kind of a difficulty because people cannot imagine exactly what an artist's role in a science research is. And also uh, as someone coming in, uh, you sort of have to make up that role and you sort of have to um, find what really interests you naturally and how to find that connection because uh, it, it, it's, not, um, it's not in the structure. Uh, but a, a very fortunate thing for me is because when I started uh, the first residency, like the first project with the Oxford uh, Clinical Research Unit was also when they first established their public engagement department. So they were a lot more interested in uh, bringing the science or bringing the research outside of the lab into schools, into the general public uh, to create a sort of a more familiar link, uh, uh, accessibility and also an understanding and interest curiosity in science. Uh, so, so because of this, um, of, of Dr. Mary Chambers and the public engagement team uh, that uh, grew from basically one person to like now a, a whole team. Uh, and because of that support, I was able to continue my uh, various collaboration with them on other projects. Uh, so um, in a way, the timing was good for me, it worked out well. Uh, perhaps if it, if they didn't establish this public, uh, and I think this public engagement uh, department is also something that many science research units now uh, are interested in um, establishing, uh, more interested in than before in traditional kind of lab science. Um, so maybe there is also a shift in sort of making science not so so just like a, in its own ivory tower but sort of trying to make it more interdisciplinary and, and and linking it with other fields as well yeah I, i'm sure like with the, i'm sorry but with a, a, a social anthropologist uh, is it I, I would imagine that Fred, Frederick, you would have also what, what similar. What I just expect from anthropologists is to help them write questionnaires because they're very aware that the, the questions they raise about the practices that could um, um, uh, trigger zoonosis um, are, are not raised properly. So they, they want to know about the culture and, and practices of people before uh, asking questions, uh, but we we're not here to give pictures. I mean, we we we're trying to build narrations, um, but but just finding one image is something very hard. Often communication people do that, and it's better to have artists because artists know more about the background. They are more emerged, I guess. Uh, so yeah, following on that, like there is a certain pressure to be an illustrative artist, like uh, or um, sort of an advertiser. So people, when you first come, then I, 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 I think what people could imagine is, okay, you're going to, to sort of make these posters about the science and you're going to help them educate people. Uh, but often, I'm, you know, that, that's uh, more of the illustrative or, or designer side and and as an artist I think you have a more uh, uh, more overarching interest you have your own interest and you're you're more interested in questions I think than just conveying a message thank you very much for that answer Vibhu Dube asks, can't the feathers be sanitized before exporting since uh, it's not meant to be eaten? What was the need to ban the import of feathers? 
Uh, yes, so they dry it under the sun, and then they have these large um, stoves that they uh, they dry it over. Uh, so it should be dried more or less, but at the same time, uh, there's no guarantee, I think. And, and basically at that point, uh, when there's an outbreak, then any small uh, threat uh, would just basically, I think elimination is better than taking the risk. Uh, so, mm. so there's less incentive. And so basically it's, it's the same um, uh, rationale with, uh, with killing uh, the livestock that mm. you know you rather kill the whole herd or the whole farm uh, instead of checking and see which one's well and which one's not because that's just too much uh, risk and time consuming and uh, yeah so um, so basically the government just say you know completely just kill the entire population of poultry or or pig uh, whichever animal is uh, infected at that time uh, in and the region. Yeah, a, a, a pillow is a very intimate contact with feathers because you, you only have a small textile. So mm. I guess in, if you think about the imaginary, having bird feathers from Vietnam in your pillow, uh, <laughs> you think there's a threat <laughs> because you spend a lot of time. I, yeah, with, with <laughs> I think that and the, the coats that we use as well. Uh, but obviously in China, they have like more of a industrial scale turbines and heat mm. heating system so it's um, really by that point it's sanitized i think by the point it gets to your pillow mm. uh, but but from vietnam it's still considered like raw material mm. so uh, yeah higher yeah. risk and i i don't know if it affected a uh, chinese export of feathers during that time because uh, they take up like 80 percent of the market uh, very, mm. very large. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm not sure. I have no statistic on this. Yeah. I think that answers one of the questions that an anonymous attendee had who asked, what is the use of duck feathers, especially what's China's interest in importing it from Vietnam? Is there anything you'd like to add? Oh, uh, yeah. So, so like uh, Frederick mentioned, it's in the pillows. And a lot of the jackets, the, the very uh, heavy duty ones for cold climate, uh, because down feather is um, a lot warmer. Uh, it keeps the bird warm. So that's why we're, we're boring from the bird uh, to mm. keep us warm. Uh, so all the, yeah, in places like uh, Europe or, or Canada, US, uh, any place with snow, uh, that's what they use, uh, Korea. So I think a big, yeah. Um, mainly it's into uh, coats and pillows and blankets, blankets as well. Yeah, so there's a large so market for it. It raises very similar problems to um, the mink industry uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, because we have seen that uh, Denmark has uh, shut down its mink industry and killed, uh, I think, 17 million minks. Wow. Uh, because they replicated the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But actually the main consumer of uh, Ming fur is, uh, is China and they have a, a big industry also. Wow, so that's, I guess that's it's another... a fancier than duck. <laughs> so <Yes. laughs> it's an exchange. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Leonard, so Burgett has a question for you. Uh, she says, thank you so much for the introduction to your work. How much knowledge about infectious diseases does the viewer need to bring to seeing the film? Is the portrayal more about re-seeing and reconsidering the labor of humans with animals or about the animal itself? I don't think you need any knowledge. In fact, I'm a, it's usually promoted through the science platform because, uh, because of its link uh, with the, the, the science research unit that I work with and because it's uh, a presence in, you know, uh, in, in when it was shown at the Wellcome Trust. Um, but you really don't need it. It's more like a very uh, sort of a, a brief, you're like a visitor briefly entering the, this village and seeing a way of life that is 
uh, in a way very strange, I think, uh, for the average like urban dweller, um, what they work with and uh, and and um, and you see this lightness and and you also know that there's a certain uh, like uh, yes yeah, sanitary issues going on, but but you are you, so it's. I, I made it more as an experiential piece uh, of, of, yeah, uh, of having this feeling and, and this sort of being immersed in feathers as well and uh, seeing these very brief moments of human and turning into animal almost in the imagination. Um, yeah, so, so I, I just think it's more of a, a feeling piece more than than a documentary, it's not. It's not really a documentary. Sure. So, uh, Vibhu wants to know: Is the system not being able to adapt to new practices required for large-scale production a problem of people not adapting, or the government not putting in new regulation or practices? Uh, is this uh, meant for the, the the collecting and processing of the feathers? Yes, yes. Uh, um, no, I think it's just a custom because it's a, a, um, just something that they have been doing for, for many generations. And in fact, I think it's a very, it's a nice process because it makes use of all the animal produce uh, that is generated from our consumption uh, of meat uh, because then, you know, the feathers don't just get thrown away, uh, but are are collected and recycled and used. And it's just uh, uh, something that made sense in the past, uh, but maybe today, uh, so that's why today there are less people doing it because they can find much better jobs uh, for better pay. Uh, yeah, and less less uh, strenuous or, or dusty and dirty uh, or yeah, so. Um, but I, I don't know, when we try to industrialize everything, there's also a, quite a lot of problem that comes with that when the scale is just crazy and you're trying to like do everything efficiently or, you know, like, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, there's a, another chain of problems that come with that. So Lena, there are two questions. Uh, I'm just going to go them into one. Uh, because of we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. So Abhinit says, how can art and science possibly articulate the urgent need for reducing human consumption? And Soumya asks, what impact do you think this aspect of the arts, uh, creativity, storytelling has on the way that people can learn about science or scientific practices? Mm. I think... Mm, the arts and and storytelling is uh, comes from curiosity. So so I think any sort of if you want to learn about anything, it stems from the initial curiosity about that subject matter, and that's very important. And also um, mode of questioning, because a lot of things nowadays is it's very complex. Uh, it's not simple and you have to question and you have to try to look at it from different angles. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how it can, um, but I think and science, science is also like a, a curiosity about the world, <laughs> totally, uh, very much so. So I don't see it as very separate actually. Uh, but it's just um, uh, different modes of in inquiry. And uh, storytelling, I think, is important because what story we tell and what story we listen to reflects our value, like what we value, what we care about. Uh, and so that's why I always try to um, turn to mythology as well uh, and, and the various very kind of um, fundamental story that that creates human civilization, basically, uh, and and how it reflects our changing values through time, uh, because um, 
yeah, when we have a certain respect for things, then then yeah, we can um, we can sort of be more aware and careful. But you know, making art is is in a way polluting. I think there's no way around it. I think being alive is uh, is consuming, and so. Um, as humans, we, we, we consume and we consume a lot more than we actually need. So um, it's, it's just uh, up to each person to really try their best to, to minimize the impact. But uh, you can never, you can never uh, completely uh, eradicate your presence because, yeah. Thank you so much for that answer, Lena. Thank you so much for allowing us to showcase your film at Contagion. And thank you, Frederick, for joining Lena for this fascinating discussion and for sharing your insights about the film. I'm sorry if you can't see me on screen right now. I seem to be having some technical issues. Uh, but I just wanted to thank you both so much for joining us. And uh, I'd like to thank the audience as well for coming here and attending the discussion. In case you miss watching the film, I would encourage you all to visit our website where the film is uploaded. We have a collection of stellar films which are free to watch until the 13th June, which is when the exhibition ends. You can also register for the discussions that will follow the screening of the films. If you found this program interesting and would like to know more about how zoonotic diseases emerge and why we need to pay attention to the health of animals, birds, people, and our environment, I would encourage you to sign up for Michael Brasilia's lecture on contagion across species and Umar Ramakrishnan's lecture on One Health. We will also have a workshop conducted by the ECHO Network and the Bengaluru One Health City Consortium on decoding One Health. You can find the registration links to these programs in the chat box. Uh, at 6.30 p.m. today, which is in half an hour, we have a lecture by Sylvie Brand on contemporary faces of epidemics and pandemics on how to deal with the infodemic. So please do join us there. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much, Frederick and Lena, for spending time with us on a Sunday. Uh, we all hope you have a great weekend, and we'll see you at our next program. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye.